This is a Jack Kemp oral history project interview with William Bennett, former education secretary and Jack Kemp's partner at Empower America. We're doing this at the Jack Kemp Foundation in Washington, D.C. Today is December 11th, 2012, and I'm Morton Kondracki. Thanks so much for doing this. Sure. So when you think about Jack Kemp, what immediately comes to mind? Well, I miss him, uh, um, particularly now. I mean, Jack had uh, the kind of lift uh, and reach and enthusiasm that we don't associate with a lot of Republicans right now. Uh, I miss him, too, in personal terms. He was a close friend, one of the closest friends I had. And uh, he was a wonderful opposite to me in, uh, in a lot of ways. We were kind of like a marriage. We're, we're compatible by being different, you know. And um, he taught me a lot. Um, he taught me a lot about economics, but he also taught me a lot about optimism. I am probably chronically, um, constitutionally a pessimistic, Catholic, original sin, darkness of man's soul, work to get out the light. Jack was not that. Uh, if uh, Reinhold Niebuhr's book, The Children of Light and the Children of Darkness, I was a child of darkness. Jack was a child of light. So I needed him. He maybe needed me a little bit. So where do you think that optimism came from? <clears throat> California, quarterback, sunlight. I said we had a dinner once with football, with some football function, and he was throwing balls around. And uh, he introduced me very generously and said, Bill and I played the same game. Well, first of all, you know, I played college football at Williams. He was a professional football player for Pete's sakes. That's not the same game. Our big game Were was... Were you a quarterback? No. I said second. I was a tackle, interior lineman. I said for Jack, it was all sunshine, California, cheerleaders, touchdowns. For me, it was a guy named Kozlowski in the mud. You know, that's not the same game. And that, in some ways, kind of emblematic of, of our differences. But uh, he was always very generous with me, even threw the ball at me and let me throw a few balls around. We had a touch football game he came out to and uh, brought Jimmy and uh, Jeff, and we all played. And I got a lesson. Uh, this was just one football game? or was it a we, had a, game? we had a regular touch football game on Sundays where uh, the Kemp boys, when they were in town, would come. But Jack graced us with his presence once, which was great. Um, so, uh, besides optimism and lift, what would you say are his major character strengths? Um, optimism and lift, I'd say them again, and um, no problem can't be addressed, solved. Belief that we could work together, I'm going to use football here a lot, because it was a very important part of his life and a metaphor, it's an important part of my life too. Um, when I was Secretary of Education, I was the first person asked to name the most influential teacher in my life, and I named my high school football coach. So this was a very important common ground for, for me and Jack. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is that Jack believed in the huddle. If you all got together, we could work it out, and you could score, you could win, you could solve the problem. And uh, you know, although he would make sounds and noises when you were giving him some bad news, he'd have the telltale Kemp, uh, 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 uh. he'd then say, all right, now what do we do? How can we make this work? And uh, he went to work on it. He had a great mind, analytical mind. He studied hard. I first met Jack, or is that part of your sequence? So no, go ahead, go ahead. When, through Irving Crystal, you would think a couple of jocks like I would meet at a you know, in the 40 yard line. I met him through Irving Crystal, and Irving said, Here's one of your fans. And Jack said, Oh, you follow Congress. I said, No, I follow football. And then I heard the story. Crystal told me that Jack had asked him for a reading list. I'm sure you've heard the story. He read uh, all the books that Irving gave him. He saw Irving about eight weeks later and said, Give me, give me a reading list, another reading list. He said, I already gave you one. Jack said, I already read all those books. And uh, so Irving gave him another one. Um, he was a good student, a very good student. He would say he was a late student. You know, he came to it late. But all the passion uh, and conviction of the autodidact. And uh, loved to quote, as he quoted speeches, he loved to quote books. He was um, infectious, uh, alive, infectious, intellectually serious, curious, and um, optimistic, important. What, what was Irving Crystal's book list, do you know? Uh, I don't remember. 
Um, it was, uh, I'm sure, uh, classics. I'm sure The Federalist. I'm sure um, Jaffa and Burns and all that stuff, you know, the battle, the neocons and the cons, Straussian stuff, uh, and also, I'm sure, economics books. Mm -hmm. uh, so if he had flaws, what were they? Uh, optimism and lift. Um, I told him once, I said, if you believed in original sin, you'd be the president of the United States. I said, if you could just ever, uh, it's not just optimism and lift, it was that extended hand. He believed everyone was a potential friend. He had no enemies, so he just, he, he just didn't. And he'd say, you know, Charlie Rangel, great guy. And I'd say, oh, I don't know about Charlie Rangel, he'd be a great guy. He was my chairman, I knew Charlie pretty well. Um, everybody was a great guy. Jack got along with everybody. Um, it led him to believe that people would act in reliable ways, ways that they would keep their word, that they could be trusted, um, and that uh, that he often got burned. In that um, so I think that was that was a problem for him. But um, in the one of the worst hours of my life was the debate with Al Gore where he didn't engage Gore, he didn't take Gore on. He wanted to be friends with Gore, and they wanted to, he wanted to have a friendly debate in the best spirit of congeniality and what's the word we use, comedy. But uh, he needed to hit him a little bit, but Jack wasn't one to hit. He'd get hit, like he got hit in football, and he'd get up. Um, but he wasn't one to throw a punch. And politics ain't beanbag. Is that a weakness? Probably because, you know, I'm thinking of someone else you're probably talking to in this, Newt Gingrich. When Newt hit his high point during the primaries, I'm not saying this was the greatest moment of the primaries, but it's when people said, I want Newt in there because Noodle, Noodle take him on. Noodle, Noodle throw a punch. And I would say to my radio audience, is that what you want? I mean, is that what we want, the president? Yes, actually it is. <laughs> That's what we want. Jack wouldn't throw a punch. I never saw him throw a punch on what prevented him from throwing a punch? Um, I mean, he'd seen lots of punches thrown in football. And, and he received you know. plenty. Uh, I don't know. His mother, his goodness, a kind of gentleness, um, the belief that we could all get in the huddle, all 11 of us, and no matter what our views and our convictions and our backgrounds, we could all work it out together. There was that just indomitable optimism uh, and pragmatism. Did you ever talk to him about uh, quarterbacking and life, and quarterbacking and leadership? I don't think explicitly. I mean, he was a natural and obvious leader, um, having come as a quarterback, and you know, a lot of these guys are. But um, no, my advice to him was always to, I kind of got tired of my advice to him, was always to look on the dark side, the downside. I got tired of listening to myself. I'd say, Jack, there's trouble here. There are people here we can't be sure of. There are downsides to this proposal. But he woke me up to so many things and led me on so many things and educated me on a lot of things. Such as? You know what I was thinking of lately on the way over? Prop 187. You know about that in California. And he called me up and said, we got to do this. We have to lead on this. Just explain what it's. It was a, it was a state initiative on immigration, very similar to the issues we're talking about now, and it was whether I can't remember exactly, but it was about providing services to immigrants and the children of immigrants. And California wanted to deny those services, schools, hospital care, and so on. And uh, Jack and I talked about it. We wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Big up at it. It was big because it got a lot of attention, a lot of negative attention. And there was a lot of heat. We were both at Empower America at the time. I wasn't sure I wanted to sign on to it. And then um, he talked me into it. And he talked me into it by making the arguments for it. And I still hear about it. You know, when I get engaged in the immigration debate now on the radio, people say, I hope you're not going back to your 187 thing, you know, that sort of business. But we were right in what we said and um, still right. And that was, Jack talked me into that. He talked me into joining Empower America. He said there would be no fundraising, very little travel. <laughs> Total lies. <laughs> and uh, 
and not too many nights out again, you know, and there won't be a problem. We'll raise the money. But uh, there were plenty of problems. He also educated me about uh, NAFTA, which, you know, that's not my areas. We used to, we used to joke at Empower America that, uh, you know, people came into the sunny end, Jack's end, and then they'd come down to my end. They'd say, what's going on down here? And I'd say, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know. <laughs> but like, they'd stay a while just to see what was going on, you know. They were curious. But um, I didn't know a lot about other issues than the issues I knew about. He educated me about NAFTA. And my reward there was, it was, wasn't a bad thing, it was Bill Clinton gave a speech and thanked a number of people for NAFTA, and thanked Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett for their leadership. We also, wouldn't want to forget this, talked during the time of the Clinton troubles about the president needing to resign. And um, I think I led Jack in that conversation. And we decided, I don't know which of us did, but we decided to go see Joe Lieberman. And it was the most memorable conversations in Washington. And we went to see Lieberman and we told him that he was um, Nathan to Clinton's David. And that he, Lieberman, had the moral credibility and the standing to go to Clinton and tell him that he had to step down. And Lieberman, you know, was embarrassed. He guys, whoa, that's a big job. And he wouldn't do it, he won't do it even if I tell him. But uh, Jack was eloquent and persuasive and gutsy. And uh, what did Jack say to Lieberman about that? I wish I could remember exactly. I just remembered that I thought I was going to be doing most of the talking when we got there. As usual, Jack did most of the talking because he was good at it. And um, was I, it the disgrace to the presidency, the yes. de demeaning of the presidency? Yes, yeah. yes, disgrace to the country. And, uh, you know, you got a guy who got to put this behind us. And we, we, when we watched Lieberman's speech on the floor, you'll probably, you probably remember that. He came, I thought, that close because it was a very, very tough speech. And we were wondering whether he was going to pull the trigger. He didn't for whatever reasons he had. But it wasn't for lack of our trying. You and Kemp both came out for, publicly for Clinton's resignation? I did. I don't remember if Jack did. I wrote, the, I wrote a book, mm -hmm. Death of Outrage, and it was the number one bestseller. Was, Carville was number two, was the defense <laughs> of Clinton. Remember that? These are the things you remember. So what, what uh, other all-time favorite memories do you have of Jack? Um, well, the, the social ones. Um, Sundays going over to the, you know, the Holy Sepulchre watching football, you know, several games at once. The... Um, the knocks on the door, just bursting into my office. You know, I'll be on the phone, I'll be in the meeting, be there with three people in tow, you know, the, the head of some corporation, some former NFL star. You know, this is Joe Smith, this is Bill Bennett, this is a great guy, this is a great guy, he's a great guy, you're a great guy. Um, are laughing about the fact that he gave out footballs, signed footballs, and I gave out signed books. And I confessed to him that I really would like to switch. And he confessed to me that he'd really like to switch. It was very funny. Um, closest with the family. Um, got to know that family very well. And, and Jack, mine, and for all the sporting events Jack uh, went to as a father and grandfather, he ended up going to sporting events with my kids. That was a big, uh, was a big deal, and it wasn't even a football game. It was a national championship high school lacrosse game. Um, so that was a very. At least it wasn't soccer, right? No, it wasn't soccer. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. We shared that. Um, the other things I remember were, were just so many meetings of intermediaries, people coming to me saying, "You got to talk to Jack," you know. Gene Kirkpatrick, or can you talk Jack into this? Or Vin Weber. Now, poor Vin. Vin is the guy who was always the intermediary, always the guy who had to give Jack the bad news or explain to Jack you couldn't do this. But he was well practiced because he had to do this for Newt Gingrich for several years, right? But <clears throat> there was always that can you get to Jack? Can you talk to Jack? Can you explain to Jack? Board members, can you hold Jack back on this? Can you control Jack? No, I can't. I can't control Jack. 
What, did, what kind of trouble did Jack get into? Uh, overreaching, overpromising. Um, sure, we can do that. Empower America can do this, that, and everything else. Uh, I can't remember specifics. We were supposed to have a pretty narrow charter. We were going to do this kind of stuff with Gene Kirkpatrick and school choice with Bill Bennett and Jack, you know, enterprise zones. <clears throat> and then it was just the latest enthusiasm, you know, person who walked through the door, Jack would entertain it because he had that capacity to enjoy an idea in its, in its presentation as much as the person presenting enjoyed that idea. It's a great, it's a great empathetic gift. So when did you first become aware of it? Football. Um, game against the Jets. So the Jets won and won the Super Bowl. Uh, New York, I think the game was in New York. Um, no, I was... Well, he played in Buffalo. Yes, but this was a this was a championship game, playoff game, in, I think, in, in Jets Stadium in New York. And the Jets were at home because I think they had a better record. Check the record on that, but... Um, you I mean, you were I there? Watched him. No, the no, no, but I watched. I mean, I watched him, and I was, an a, I was an AFL fan. I was an original American Football League fan, so I knew all those guys. I thought those guys were being very badly treated and should have been allowed, you know, equality. Um, but the powers that be in the NFL wouldn't let them. So when I met Jack... Why, why, why is that? Uh, well, it was, you know, it was Roselle, it was a monopoly, it was not letting these guys in, these were upstarts, not sharing the wealth. So when I met Jack, I remember he was impressed that I knew the names of all these guys, all these obscure guys, these Buffalo Bills football players. And, um, you know... Uh, Gradually, they all made their way through the Empower America offices, and you know we had a big poster up in our uh, in our kids' room with uh, Buffalo. My kids were Buffalo Bills fans, and it had Jack Kemp and O.J. Simpson. And then we took the poster down later. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so no, that's how I first knew him. Mm -hmm. Didn't know anything about the congressional And so, stuff. what did you think about him when you just knew him as a football player? Uh, great. I mean, he held records. I mean, um, you know, he used to kind of do the light touch on his football career. But, you know, he held a record for rushing touchdowns at a quarterback until, um, what's his name, from the 49ers? Montana. No, uh, the Mormon, um, Steve Young, broke it. Uh, Jack will tell you he owed the rushing, owned the rushing title because uh, he didn't have any protections. He had to run his grandma and run. But uh, no, no, I was impressed. He was a big time, big time ball player, great quarterback. Um, Sorry, I'm when, just, when, when he was, been, uh, I've been so, up too long, so I'm, that's okay. So, uh, so politically, I mean, he runs for Congress. He gets involved in you know Kemp Roth and stuff like that. You were a Democrat, yeah, right? What uh, year is Kemp Roth? Kemp Roth is he introduced it first in '76, and then of course it became the basis of Reaganomics in in '81. Right. Um, so. Did you follow his? Yes, I was here. I was aware of it. I was, uh, you know, a Reagan appointee. I was chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, so I was paying only tangential attention to it. I was, you know, in my own little academic thing there. But uh, yes, I mean, I was aware of Jack Kemp and the significance of that. So uh, how how did Irving Crystal bring you together? Well, that was before that. That was, I think, late seventies when Crystal introduced us in New York. Um, but then Jack and I were in the cabinet together, or sort of, if you count me being in the cabinet, but it was the drug czar cabinet. This Point is Bush. Not, yes. Uh -huh. And we um, got in a lot of trouble because we were the bad boys in the cabinet. And you know about Jack's fight with James Baker and all that. Well, Jack and I tell were, us about that. Well, I don't know the details of it, but I know they had a lot of bad words between them. And I had big disagreements with Baker, too, on policy. But Jack what and I... What were your disagreements with Baker? You were drugs out of that. i got to be sure this is fine. I think it is. I think yeah, it's in my book. Um, we ha I had some plans for things I wanted to do in Columbia. And I had most of the su cabinet support. I had the vice president's support. But I had to persuade the president. And... Um, Baker stood in my way. It was, we we could in one night take out all the process, cocaine processing plants 
in Colombia. There were only about 17 of them at the time, if my memory is right. And the uh, Colombian government was in favor of it. And we could do it with helicopters and our guys. And um, it could be one night's work, and it would stop, essentially, the flow of cocaine for maybe nine months, 12 months, assuming they could then go back and build them up again. And I wanted to get this plan through. I got it through at the sub-cabinet level with, you know, smart people like Frank Keating and others, people who knew a lot. And then Baker and Nick Brady blocked it, and they had Bush's ear, of course. Um, it was war? Huh? Because it was war? Yeah. They worried about war, Vietnam, stuff like that. I said, hey, they want us to come. Well, so the South Vietnamese were not troops. This one night, we're out of there. Lots of arguments. Um, but they were different from Jack's arguments. Um, but we would often plot before a cabinet meeting how we would do a one-two. And there was one we did with the taxes when Bush was going to go raise the taxes. And Jack was crazy. I mean, he just, you know, just, I said, well, I don't know the arguments. You just, he said, well, you just follow my lead. And it was kind of comical. What happened? Because we're at the, at the cabinet meeting, and um, Jack is over, let's see, here's the table. The president's here, and Jack is over here. And across? I'm, yeah, across, and to the president's left, and I'm over here, the president's right, and the other side of the table, the president's side. And Jack is talking, and we had rehearsed this. And he's making his case, and the president's nodding, and then Jack just keeps going, goes too long, goes too long. And I start going, and Jack goes, not picking up, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Jack goes, and the president turns up. <laughs> you know, it's really ridiculous, you know. Bill? <laughs> Fine, sir. So did and you ever intervene? I said, yeah, I had like three sentences. Uh, I, remember, I remember what I said, because it was the same thing I said when uh, they asked me to be RNC chairman. Uh, I, said, I said, this wasn't a campaign promise. This was your campaign. This was the heart of it. And this is uh, not a matter of just policy. This is a matter of a commitment. And, but, you know, Jack went on and had a lot more to say and, of course, argued, argued policy. And we lost. But there was then a cartoon. I don't know if you've seen it. I think it was Business Week. And it had Bush leading a symphony. And everybody was there in their tuxedos. And over on the side, there's a guy playing the piano with a cigar. Another guy on a saxophone. That Ben and Kim. You know, we had our own music. Um, which I think was a little overdone. But we would speak out, I'd say, more often than others on um, things and make our views known very loudly. Like Jack and I had the David Duke thing. You know, the president wanted to take a neutral position, so you can't. So David Duke was running for, for Senate. The, in, Senate wasn't in it? Louisiana, or governor. senator, he, governor. He was a Ku Klux Klansman. Well, yeah, sympathetic to it, but he was a Republican, so you know, don't speak ill. I said, you just got to, Mr. President, you just got to. Jack called the president on that, and I saw the president. We were doing some drug thing, and I said, you just got to, you just got to speak out on this. Can't have any ambiguity about this. And, uh, Did so Jack that bring that up thing. in a cabinet meeting? I don't remember, but I know he brought it up. Felt very strong. That was the sort of thing, things that hit our buttons, you know. So, did you become close when you were both Bush cabinet members, or before that? Um, I guess that's when we became close. Yeah, and then uh, one of the reasons we were close is kind of the adoption of Elaine Bennett by by Joanne. Joanne had been here longer and invited Elaine to her Friday group, you know, about Friday group, mm -hmm. big deal, huge, huge effect on Elaine. And Elaine wasn't sure, you know. When was that? I think early 80s. I don't know how long it's been going. It's been going a long time. I think early 80s, but I remember how grateful Elaine was for Joanne kind of taking her under her wing and introducing her to other women who were, you know, saw the world a similar way. And... Um, so that led to us um, becoming friends with the camps, going out to the house, and doing things like that. Going this out is while dinner. you were education secretary or yes. NEH? Yes, yes. Later, more education secretary. Yeah, yeah. I may have my years off there, but uh, yes, certainly when education secretary. 
Um, Did he get involved in education policy at all? He was very interested in it. Obviously, he you know would often say, "School choice is the enterprise zone for the kid." You know, I mean the analogies were great, and we borrowed from each other's stuff on that. And he was always available to speak on that. Um, so, um, more about uh, the the dynamics of the Bush administration. So he supposedly intervened a lot in cabinet meetings on issues that had nothing to do with HUD. Right. Um, do you remember any of those? I don't ever remember <laughs> intervening on HUD. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and he taught me that you could too, you know. He'd say, well, you got it. You have a great... He said, what you said today was... I remember he said today was really smart. He said, you said, it's a very bad lesson for our children, you know. I said, he said, you can say that about anything. He, What's a bad lesson? Not to help the contrast. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I said, right, right, right. Uh, that was always an opportunity for me to say what I wanted to say about a particular issue. Yeah, no, he was very. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand that. That I had this cover as the education secretary, I could take any issue as long as I framed it in, well, Mr. President, I really think you should help the contrast. Why? Well, it's a bad lesson to our children if you don't. Was the education secretary? We're always teaching here. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, but I didn't, I didn't do it as much as he did because, I want another word, uh, Jack, you've heard before, irrepressible. He was a bit like, you know, the kid who thoughts in the head that comes out and he didn't always. Do you remember be. any specific interventions besides the ones you mentioned? No, I could probably think of some. I could probably think of some. But they were, it was rare that there was a cabinet meeting that Jack didn't speak. Did he get dressed down ever? Um, not by the president, but you could see the looks from some of the, you know, senior cabinet people, Bakers and the Bradys. Um, yeah. He must have been into Brady's business a lot. Sure. Treasury Secretary. Sure, sure he was. And, you know, he was into foreign policy. And um, he educated me there a lot. Were you there when, uh, when Baker said something to the effect that, you know, the Jews didn't vote for us? No, I wasn't no. there. Okay. I may have been at the meeting, but it was ha happened after a cabinet meeting, didn't it? Or just before? Well, I'm not sure. It was in. It was, I think it was in. It was in the White House. It was in the cabinet room, I think. And but I think it was after cabinet meeting. That was the sharp exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, no, I heard about it. And uh, supposedly Baker once said, uh, uh, "You're not Treasury Secretary. You're not Commerce Secretary. You're Housing Secretary. You're not blankety blank Secretary of State or something like that." Did you? I don't think I was there, but I remember hearing that. Mm -hmm. No, that was always edgy. Um, and how did how did Jack feel about Baker? Uh, Jack liked everybody, liked Baker, but he, he, you know, he just thought Baker was wrong on stuff. With with Jack, it was never a bad feeling. It was just you know he doesn't understand, he doesn't see. So if he had a disagreement there, I had the feeling that Baker was always, you know. Uh, there was always an element of he, he's smarter and knows better and also territorial, you know, jurisdiction. This is mine, not yours. Uh, so. um, during the, uh, d go going back a little earlier when you were education secretary, um, Kemp is the leader on, on Capitol Hill, and he is supporting Reagan basically on foreign policy and stuff, but there were occasions on tax policy, on foreign policy and stuff like that, that he got off the reservation even then. Do you recall any of that? No. Um, what did you do in the 88 campaign? 88 is uh, New Orleans? Yes. 88 is uh, Kemp is running, Bush is running, um, Dole is running. Uh, I was for Kemp. And... Um, can't remember what I did, what events I did. I was for Kemp. 
and uh, thought he had a great debate with Bush. Um, that was Houston? Yes, he did. That was a good one, right? I think so. I remember. But, uh, yeah, we wanted Jack. We thought he'd be great. Be a good, great charismatic leader, great president. And, um, and then, I, but I remember, actually, what I remember more was really working hard to get him on the ticket in New Orleans huh, before the announcement what did you came. Do? Just called a lot of people and um, everybody I could think of and lobbied. And I remember Lane was working on it, I was working on it. And I um, was very disappointed that he didn't get it. And we had a dinner that night. It was about two dozen people at Commander's Palace, maybe. And um, we were all waiting for Jack, and Jack came in late. And uh, it was, I think, the day Quail was announced. We were all kind of deflated. But before Jack came to see us, he went into the kitchen, <laughs> you know, and talked to everybody in the kitchen. Man, Adam has died. And uh, shook hands with everybody. And um, then he joined us. But that was, a, that was a big disappointment, I thought. Uh, I thought he'd be a great candidate. I was then asked to do one of the nominating speeches for Quayle, which I did. And then later, with Dole Kemp, um, I was asked to give one of the nominating speeches for Kemp. Uh, do you know the Dole story with me? No. Uh, Dole wanted to do a speech in... This is what year? This is for 96. 96. Dole wanted to give a speech Somebody persuaded him to give a speech on the culture. So he gave one at Fox Studios, and I wrote it, and a few other people worked on it, speechwriters. Fox Studios in LA. LA. But we had an idea that before that, we should go to a movie. And the movie was Independence Day. You remember the movie? I remember it well. So we took Bob Dole to the movies. There was a little tension because it was Liddy's birthday. And she hoped they were going to have the day, but she said, no, nope, we got to go to the movies. So I sat with the candidate, Dole and Elizabeth, in the movie theater, and it was over. Of course, huge, it was the summertime, summer 96, huge crowd of journalists outside. Before we went out, Dole's campaign guy, who was it, was Scott Reed, maybe, mm -hmm. said, Secretary, before we go out, you know, you're the culture guy, <clears throat> what do we, what do you recommend the senator should say? I saw a great movie about America. I said, everybody's working together. We got a black guy, and we got a Jewish guy, and we got a whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, we all come together, work together, and, uh, and defeat the common enemy. I said, got it, got it, Senator? Yeah, the Senator goes out. I said, what do you think of the movie? All says, black, white, Jew, America. You know, no conjunctives, no verbs, right? <laughs> Just hilarious. Classic Bob Noel. So he says, how about breakfast? We had breakfast. And he said, who do you think I should, uh, who do you think I should have my running mate? And I said, oh, I've been thinking about names. Somebody said Don Nichols the other day, and somebody said, I said, but I think you should have Kemp. He said, ah, oh, I'm not going with Kemp. I'm not going with Kemp. <laughs> I said, why? He said, ah, oh, his ideas. I don't agree with his ideas. You know, he's a great guy. But I don't agree with his ideas. And um, I said, what do you think of it? He said, what about, what about you? I said, me? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, why me? He said, Eastern, Catholic, intellectual. I said, I remember, I said, I'm so touched. I'm so moved. It's so personal, you know. Check, check, check. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not your guy. Um, I said, I can't do it. And I came back and told Jack. And um, I said, what do you think? He said, oh, man, you're crazy. You don't do it. I said, no, no, I really, I can't. I don't believe in it. I'm, I don't, you know, it's not my cup of tea. I'm not that excited about it. I don't think I'm the right guy. And um, besides, I wrote the Book of Virtues. And I remember we had that conversation. So what's wrong with having written the Book of Virtues? I said, well, if you, if you did everything I did in my life and you ran for president or vice president and you hadn't written the Book of Virtues, it'd be fine. But if you'd done everything I did in my life, and write the Book of Virtues, you got a problem because people think you're holding yourself out. So any, any chink in the armor is going to look worse for the guy who 
seems to be preaching to the whole country. Huh? And Jack said, I still think I'll do it. And then when Jack got the nod, <laughs> remember I said, this is great. This is just great. So well, he said, he should have gotten his first choice. Typical Jack. Um, that's, that was a... How did you find out that he'd gotten the nomination? Or was I was at the him? office, and I got a call from who? Somebody. Jack, Bill Dow, called somebody. But it was, you know, the day of the announcement. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. I, by the way, I don't want to overstate it. I mean, I think Dole was asking about my interest. He wasn't offering it to me. I think he was fishing. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't interested. Um, but it was typical, typical of Jack. Uh, going back to the cabinet days, um, uh, what, what were Jack's, what do you think Jack achieved as HUD secretary? Um, raised the profile of the office, obviously, to a degree that's never been there before. Became a spokesman for um, enterprise zones and ownership. Uh, and, you know, added a dimension to public policy and for the Republican Party that is, you know, a, a place that has not been taken by anybody else since, but which we, of which we are now acutely aware after this election. Did you work together with him on uh, driving drug dealers out of public housing? No. How did that go? How did, how did, how, what? Uh, we met with Cami. Chicago and the various people. I, 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 I wasn't central to it, I'd say, but he would always invite me. Um, he'd go off to Cabrini Green or wherever he was going. <coughs> he'd invite me, and I went on, on some visits, some trips. And then we compared notes, and we were very, we loved, loved doing that. I mean, it was great. And um, he encouraged me on my visits. When I was Secretary of Education with the schools, I don't remember this, went to 120 schools. When I became drug czar, I decided to do the same thing. And Jack, it was Jack who said, you need to go to public housing. If you want to see the drug problem, you need to go to public housing. Why? I'll never forget. He said, there are no men there. That's where these guys go. It's all women and children. So these guys can go and take advantage and just beat the crap out of people. And he said, good place for you to go. Good place for you to go. You care about this problem, that's where you should go. So that was part of my education, thanks to Jack. Um, so he was frustrated in a lot of ways with the Bush administration. Did he share that with you? He was frustrating. He was frustrated. He was very frustrating. He was also frustrating. But yeah, oh yeah, he was. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the tax pledge was a big deal and other things, other policy things. Uh, Jack just... Um, you know, is the guy who always had the better idea and often was a better idea about how to do it and how to present. And, um, you know, he could be just brilliant, just dazzling. I, I give good speech. I give a good speech. But the best speeches I've seen in my lifetime by living people, two or three of them were given by Jack. Which do you remember? I don't know. Wrote them down. I got notes somewhere I can maybe find. I've also heard Jack give bad speeches. I've heard Jack give speeches which are virtually nothing but naming everybody in the room, for God's sakes. And he'd do that, and Vin and I would say, stop, stop. And there were many Jack Kemp moments like that. We had that Power America event in Chicago. I guess you could Vin to tell you this story. I can't remember the guy's name. I think it was Heisinger. One of the Heisingers, you know? And this guy said something about immigrants and we need to close the borders. And Jack said, what's your name? He said, Heising. Jack said, Heising. Heising. He said, well, I, I'm not sure this is the right name, so don't you know, ask Vin. And he just said it about nine times. And Vin and I were up there in the panel. And Vin said, shut up, Jack, and off it. You know, and this was often her afraid this of ours. This was in public or, a, or on the... It's not a voce to me, oh, Vin, but I mean, we were all squirming. No, 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 but I mean, was he saying Jack was doing a public, audience? oh yeah, it's a dinner thing. Heisinger, Heisinger, what are you? You're not Smith, you're Heisinger. You came from somewhere, your family came from somewhere. And he was just berating this potential million dollar donor <laughs> to empower. We never got the money, I don't think. But that was, uh, that was Jack, you know, it didn't, it never gave it a thought. Um, I remember Vin afterwards said, we got it. We can only do these events 
if we can keep Jack Kemp under control. But since we can't keep Jack Kemp under control, maybe we shouldn't do these events. Um, just uh, to finish up on the uh, on the cabinet days, um, Dick Darman. Yeah. Uh, he wrote in his book that uh, the two conservatives in the cabinet, you and Kemp, were the ones who were always asking for money. And and uh, so Jack seems to have had a lot of run-ins with. In fact, Darman banned the word empowerment from administration documents, which was a direct. A rebuttal to you guys, I, I think. So, do you did you do you remember any of Jack's specific run-ins with Darman? I remember my run-ins with Darman, but I don't remember Jack's run-ins with Darman. But I'm not surprised. Um, because Darman was architect, and he not wanted his way, and he had a very clear and and concise view of what he should do. I was. It was all about money. The, the end of the day. Yeah. It was the end of the day. It was yeah. And um, yeah, I wanted more money for various things, but I thought, you know, I'm a conservative, but this, like, I regarded the drug effort in those days as kind of an adjunct to the Defense Department. This is a legitimate function of government, particularly the stuff we were doing in Latin America, which was having some great effect. So, no, I was locking horns with Darman all the time, and Jack and I would often sympathize with each other about what a tough-minded son of a bitch he was. His son now works at Carlisle Group, and my son was there this summer, and his son was saying, my dad used to talk about his arguments with you, with your dad and Jack Kemp and how much he enjoyed them. Didn't know he enjoyed them. <laughs> Didn't know he enjoyed them. Good. Okay, Empower America. Um, how does it get hatched? Uh, Jack, I don't know. Jack called me up and asked if I wanted to be one of the principals. And he said, uh, Vin Weber's involved, and I'll get Gene Kirkpatrick, and you do your thing, we'll do our thing. And um, this will be great. We'll be the counterweight to what's going on and important things for us to do. Now, this is policy. when? 93? Does that sound right? I think so. Right after Clinton's inauguration? <clears throat> right after Clinton, yeah. And um, we'll be there. We'll be well, respectful disagreement, policy issues. There we were, you know, 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where we were on 9-11. Uh, and um, he said, it'll be fun, it'll be good. And I, I told you, he said, there won't be much travel, won't be much fundraising, not be many nights out, all of which were untrue. But it was good, and we had a good board, and we had smart people, and we had a lot of arguments, because these are argumentative people, you know, Steve Forbes and Ted Forsman, People like that. I was always, always regarded myself as a junior member, even though I was a full partner, because I didn't do, I didn't raise the money. Jack raised the money. <coughs> Floyd Kwame raised the money. Ted Forsman raised the money. But I, you know, I felt I, I had a, um, a place there certainly, and we had great people there. We had great staff, young people, Pete Wainer, Paul Ryan, um, lots of good people. Um, so it was his idea. I think so. I think so. It might have been Vin. So you've done Vin, right? Vin would know. Vin would also be modest. But I think it was Jack's idea. Yeah. And um, it was just very, very, very good at that because if you're going to be in opposition uh, and you want to be listened to and you want a hearing and you want to be able to get a hearing even at the opposition White House, then you want to go about it the way Jack Kemp went about it. And I learned that from him. And so we were able to contribute to the debate on things like NAFTA and immigration policy and other things, where we were sometimes castigated by conservatives. So, okay, but then again, we were the conservatives in the Bush cabinet, so it's funny roles. So what other issues did you take on? I took on, uh, well, <laughs> we did, I, did, um, I did drug policy. I did mostly education policy, and that's where there was a fair amount of overlap with Jack. And then we got into uh, what you might call cultural policy. Um, there was a fairly famous visit we made to New York. I went with Joe Lieberman and Dolores Tucker, and we went to see the guys at um, uh, Time Warner about gangster rap and some of that stuff. And um, that became fairly high profile criticisms of uh, some of the music and some of the stuff that was coming out. 
and we gave out the Silver Sewer Award contributions, which brought down American culture. We gave it to 60 Minutes for showing Jack of working and killing somebody on television and, and other things. And uh, it got a lot of attention because, it, you know, it was cultural stuff and it was Hollywood and Hollywood versus Washington and became pretty big stuff around... Uh, this is the era of the index of leading cultural that's indicators. That's correct. I did that. That's, I wrote that. Thank you. I wrote that uh, there first time um, and published it at... Uh, Power didn't publish it. Heritage actually published it. I was a joint Heritage and Power. But then Rush read from it for weeks and so it just, you know, three million copies of it. And people became very interested in that. That's when I make the joke about drug, sex, rock and roll. But these were big issues and still are big issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what was Jack's output? J Jack's? Output. I mean, you're, you're... Oh, I mean, enterprise zones, economics, economic policy, um, <clears throat> the HUD stuff. But I, I think it was mostly economics, tax policy, growth, the pie. I mean, it was classic Jack. That's what he did. That's what he did great. But did he put out uh, reports and products and stuff like that? Yes, he and Larry Hunter and Ryan later. Um, lots of speeches, I think, reports. Um, then Jack, you know, did a fair amount of stuff on the Hill. Um, and he was always Jack. He was still the Jack of Kemp Roth. So was the idea of this that you were going to be a think tank or you were going to be a... No, we were a 501c4, so we were an action tank or something like that, policy. We can make policy recommendations, not endorse candidates, but come out strongly for policy. We weren't a think tank so much as a recommendation of policy tank, and which we did all the time on everything. And what was your budget? Wasn't much. Um, supposed to be paid, but I think most years I wasn't paid. I don't think Jack was paid. Staff was paid. I don't think Vin took anything or Jean took anything. Jean shared time with AEI. I shared time was with Was she Heritage. ever there? Did she have Rarely. Yeah. Rarely. But she was involved. She, was, she wasn't there during the days, but she came to evening events and functions and fundraisers, and she was present. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we took fairly high profile on things like, um, oh, what's it called? Permanent Normal Trade Relations, China, uh, where I descended from the group. I had my own reasons. But a Jack big, was Jack was four. Yes, big letter that was signed by Jack, Vin, Gene, board members, Don Rumsfeld. I mean, you know, it was a really lustrous board. Um, and others, and that was a, that was a very typical kind of empower America thing. Because to do. it was a free trade thing, right? And it was big names and high profile. And here's where we are. Here's where we're with the Clinton administration. Here's where we're not. It was actually, I mean, in retrospect, when it was started, I, I did it for for friendship. I thought Jack asked me, I'll do it. Lane said, do it. But it actually was a good idea, not a bad thing. Where you weren't, you know, knee jerk opposed to everything that came out of the White House, the other party. Uh, you, you measured it and evaluated it, and we were treated pretty nice and respectfully by that White House. So, did you? And that was the, also remember the days of you will remember this, being Morton Kondracki. This was the days of the DLC. There was a DLC, and if you if you took the difference between the DLC and Empower America on issues, often there wasn't a lot of light. Mm -hmm. uh, did the organization work that you would agree on what you, what you were going to do and then put out a press release? Somebody, some, somebody would... Yes, somebody had the lead, and then they'd pass it around. And I remember Jack would have a paper. I would, maybe couldn't understand it, but he'd want my signature on it, so I'd, I'd have Ryan or Pete Weiner or somebody explain it. And then if it was important for me to say yes and I understood it and was comfortable enough, I would. If I didn't, I'd pass. But on the big things... You know, when the big things were things like that, permanent normal trade relations, Prop 187, um, NAFTA, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion debate. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did it last? How long did it go? Well, it sort of morphed into that Freedom Works thing, right? I'd want to say five years. Is that right? I think so. 
So till into into through through Clinton or not not all the way through Clinton. Where was Jack in '96? Uh, so Clinton's uh, inaugurated in '93. Jack runs for vice president in '96. Was he still with Amer uh, Empower America after that? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think so. You said that that you were there in 9/11. Yeah. 2011. No, 2001. 2001. I mean, 2001. Right. Yes, I was. And was he? Yeah, I guess so. Sure. Sure. So sure, it lasted. Were you were you actually in the office when the uh, planes hit? I was in. Uh, no, I was down the street. I was two blocks away doing a videotape on. Uh, something else, and then I came back to the office, and it was when when the Pentagon was being hit. And uh, Jack just, was there? I don't think so. It was just chaos. It was people, I remember, you know, getting to 1701 Pennsylvania Avenue and seeing the White House just emptying, you know. So it was, you know, late morning. And then there were rumors, you know, State Department's been bombed, everything's been bombed, Capitol's been bombed, people panicking. Yes, you're absolutely right, 2001, yep. So I guess I was there until probably 2002 or three. I guess it lasted longer than that, eight years. Yeah. And Jack was there the whole way. But, but it became, a, you know, it, it, sometimes it was a more full-time affiliation than other times. If we had the money or if you had to go get your money by giving speeches, which I was doing, or being at Heritage, then you spent more time there and you just dropped in once a week. I, I, I take it that, that you were sort of independent operators. You did, I mean, you, you got, you basically paid your, your way by making speeches and writing your books, and Jack yeah. did his by making speeches, Washington's Figures Bureau or something That's like right. that. That's yeah. right. There wasn't much reason after Bush was elected for Empower America, because it was established to be a responsible voice of opposition. Do you remember any fights with Clinton? Well, um... So who raised the money? Jack and the board. Jack. And who put the board together? Jack. Floyd Kwame was our chairman. Nick Forsman was, who was chairman. Floyd Kwame? Floyd Kwame a, was a, one of the founding chairmen of uh, Kleiner Perkins. And um, the famous partners, the Democrat, John Doerr, and Floyd is the Republican. He gave lots of money and power. Nick Forsman gave a lot of money and power, and he and Jack were constantly arguing, fighting. Over? Everything. Why? Everything. I, I don't know, just, it, he was, he was a guy Organizational like thing? Organizational or? policy, everything. He just liked, Forsman just liked to argue. And um, he'd have these dinners in New York we'd go up to where he'd have Julian Robertson and some of these other, you know, huge investor venture fund, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. Private the, equity. Yeah, big guys. Hedge funds. Hedge funds, right? Dinners, and you know, we would we would sing our song, try to get support. But they were Jack was always lead. Because he wasn't a great fundraiser when he was trying to raise money for his own political campaign. No. Was he better at uh, yeah, Power was, America? Yeah, he was better working for the, pay the staffs of other people. Yeah, you know. he was pretty good, but. The chairman, when they took the job, knew that that was that was a big part of their job. This is Vim, or the, or the, the chairman, chairman of the, the various chairmen, Forbes, Forsman, Kwame. And what was Vin's role? Um, Vin Roberts, peacekeeper, intermediary. I think I quit three or four times, and Vin talked me, you know, back off the ledge. Jack would call me. I don't know. I don't know why I quit. For some, for some reason or other. But um, Jack was forever inviting people to be fellows and to be partners and to be on the board and to this. And you, know, you can work with Bill Bennett. No, I don't want to work with him. But that was Jack. You know. So who else was around? I mean, besides everybody knows about Pete Wayner, who was your d assistant, yeah, right? Yeah, Chief assistant. Yeah. He was kind of to me what Paul was to, to Jack. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for how long? For how long was uh, Paul Ryan there? I want to say two years. We overlapped for two years, maybe three. But then Paul and I became pretty good friends afterwards because of some common interests. Um, Pete was there a long time until he went to the Bush White House. 
with Carl Rove and Gerson. So he went, he went in 2000. And um, Al Cole, someone else I know, David Quo, who wrote that book about Bush and the religion, which damned him for <coughs> with, the, with the conservatives forever. Um, who else was there? I can't remember. Um, so you, you were referring to the, to the uh, people of light and the people of darkness. I mean, supposedly, you, your big debate with Jack intellectually was over w poverty, what, what supposedly, this is what I've heard, that in other words, he was a kind of an economic determinist and you were more a culture person. And so if his notion was that if you gave anybody the right incentives, they would do right in their lives. And if you, and you said, no, that's not, that that's too simple. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. I, I, I thought. Do you remember any specific, uh, or was this on running, ongoing? It was debate? ongoing. It was ongoing. I mean, Jack would say that um, ownership itself will transform. Um, and I sort of can't transform character. He said, well, a guy who's never had anything and then he gets something, he has a chance then. So he has, a, I'd say, he has a chance. But if the right values haven't, in some ways, been inculcated in him, it could happen. But it's miraculous. And um, why can't we just agree that you give people opportunity, but you also need instruction, habits, Aristotle? And um, he'd say, fine, but you can't wait. You know. So I mean, this was the argument that went on and on with us. He, I thought he was a bit, and I used to. Say, I said, you're just a, a Marxist, you know, you're a Marxist, and, you know, a, a good guy Marxist. You just think it's all about, you know, opportunity and enterprise and giving people a chance, and I'm for that. But if people have the chance but don't have the wherewithal to take full advantage of the chance, um, they're going to blow it, and uh, they'll default on their loans. They'll, I wasn't that smart, they'll, uh, you know, they'll blow it. <laughs> they'll wreck their property. Um, so that was the ongoing debate. Um, and Jack was prepared to concede that, but always wanted to say it was complicated, but that you could never find out what was in people unless you gave them that opportunity. Fair enough, fair enough. Look, I said school choice was a very good place for us to meet because if you're for school choice, you're more, it's in some ways you're more Kempian than Benettian, if I can say that. You're for everybody having it. And that means some people won't make the right choice. But um, and you can, And you agreed on yes, school choice. Yes, was yes, Was he active on school choice? Yes, he was. I was certainly totally fully supportive. Um, but um, he said, you know, by your, by your thesis, people aren't smart enough to do the right thing. I remember I had the hearing when I was Secretary of Education with Gus Hawkins. Remember Augustus Hawkins, who was chairman of the committee? And I said, you know, the people in your L.A. district should have the opportunity to choose their schools. And he said, a lot of the people in my district aren't smart enough to make that choice. I said, well, they're smart enough to choose you. You know, this is a funny moment. Jack, Jack loved that story, you know, and he said, well, see, that's your view, right? They're not smart enough. I said, no, they are. This is about their kids, and they will listen to other people who inform themselves and, and follow, but and this, is, this is a choice you should give people, certainly better than the current position. But there isn't... Uh, um, there isn't a re there's no reason we can't try to educate people about what choices are the best choices to make, too. Um, you know, Jack always talked about the fish and teaching a man how to fish. Give a man a fish, teach a man how to fish. I said, but teaching a guy how to fish is more than teaching him how to fish. It's te teaching him to be patient and to tie things right and to sit in the boat all day and have perseverance and, you know, the virtues. And I think Jack was somewhat persuaded, but never fully. And I was never fully persuaded of the transformation that takes place just with opportunity. I said, I've seen too many people have the opportunity and blow it. So that was our ongoing So were these, uh, were these bull sessions or were these around specific issues? They were so both. They were bull sessions. They were constant. They were during football games. They were, we were traveling together. And they were an, on panels, on policy debates, on any, everything we did. Um, and Jack would talk and say, I know Bill Bennett is going to jump me now. 
but here's what I believe. And I'd say that I know Kemp is going to object here. But, but there, you know, we did the same thing publicly we did privately. Um, did, um, uh, what, what were his work habits like when he was there? Um, I don't know. I mean, um, multitasking. I remember being in Philadelphia with him at the convention, and we went out to dinner, and a phone started ringing, and he didn't know which. He had four of them, and he was, you know, <laughs> the, the person, the whole person was ringing, you know. And he'd be carrying on a conversation. I marveled at that because I can't do that. And people would come up and say, oh, you're going to make my friend Bill Bennett. So, so, so. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know how he worked, but he worked. He was always working. I mean, I know, I know he worked on planes, and he just have you know stacks of stuff, and he just go through it, make notes, long handwrite notes. You know. Did you do any foreign travel together? Nope. Nope. Um, so I did a lot of foreign travel. The drugs are a job, but not with Jack. You know, that's what, that was one difference in the jobs. So uh, tell me about the you, you and Joanne and uh, and Elaine and uh, Jack did did stuff together. What did you do besides watch football? Uh, pretty much it. Uh, his house on Sunday, always his house. Um, sit around the pool, um, and um, well, Jack did bring a formative moment in my kids' development. Jeff played for the Eagles. And they played the Redskins here. And Jack, Jeff got off the bench and played in the game. He got sacked about 15 times. We watched the game on TV. Two hours later, the doorbell rang, and it was Jack and Jeff at the door. And my boys, at perfect age, like 14 and 9. And there, were, uh, <coughs> there was Jack Kemp and Jeff Kemp, and we just saw on TV. And it was just very generous of him to do that. Typical, typical kind of thing. But <coughs> it was his house, it was his castle. And we were almost always there. If he came to our house, he was in and out fast. You know, he wanted to get to his house, his chair, his TV, his controls. Uh, did you go to Vail? Yes. Yes, a couple times. And we had Empower stuff there. Mm -hmm. We didn't go to ski. We're not skiers, but we went to Vail for Empower stuff because we did, did the same show out there. Yeah. Um, okay. So where in, in conservatism... In the history of American conservatism, does Jack Kemp fit? Um, I, well, very much in the, I don't know quite how what you mean by the question, but I think very much in the Reagan tradition, if we can say that's a tradition, the sunny brand of conservatism, optimistic, forward-looking, which we've never been in more need than we are now. We've never needed Jack Kemp than we do now in that spirit. Um, forward-looking, what do you call us, what do you call us, Con progressive conservatives, is that what he called us? Something Sometimes like that. Sometimes bleeding heart, too. Bleeding heart conservatives, progressive conservative, con pro progressive conservatives. Big government conservative. No. No? He didn't, did he say that? No, he didn't Not say that. Not from but me. He, but, he, but he believed in a big HUD. Yeah, he did believe in a big HUD. I believed in a big Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, but um, good-hearted, capacious, optimistic, uh, encouraging, enabling, empowering. That's where he is. So, uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, the, I guess, so this is, this is Reagan. It's not Goldwater. It's not Russell Kirk. It's right. not, it, right. it, was he a neoconservative, do you think? Sympathetic to neoconservatism, but neoconservative. Irving Crystal was one of his mentors. Oh, right? one of his godfathers, but not, didn't have, again, didn't have that fundamental view of man's flawed nature. Um, you know, believed that, I mean, I just always said, Jack, you're just this short of utopianism, the kind of stuff the left does, which gets us in so much trouble. So no, 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 never, never get there. Don't believe in that. Um, uh, right. Did you, ever, did you ever talk to him about Christian science? No. And the influence that that had? No. That's very positive. No. You know, well, did it have an influence on him? He was a Christian scientist as a kid, yeah. As a kid. And some people think that he never stopped oh, having. Yeah, well, maybe. So, so you, rega you regard him as an intellectual? Yes, first rate. Uh, not the normal type, but he could parse an idea 
fast. And he came in and said, what is this? What does this mean? And I, you know, explained it as best I could. He, he was fast. Uh, once he got it, he wanted to move on to something else. He was impatient. And, you know, certain definitions of intellectual require a certain scholarly disposition or temperament, which he did not have. He had the temperament of an activist and a doer. But yes, I regard him as an intellectual, for sure. And, uh, Very little he couldn't grasp. And Except the fundamental nature of man. <laughs> okay. And obviously you think he was smart. Yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so good and so generous, you know. Um, first uh, call I got when that gambling story hit on me was Jack. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, just, it was a, just a call of friendship. And, you know, come on out, we'll have dinner. And then uh, it was just very sweet, very Jack. Mm -hmm. So what was your relationship with him post Empower America? Um, oh, we were still close friends, more the house and visits, and uh, saw him less frequently. But probably as much through Elaine and Joanne, because she still goes. She'll be going this Friday, the Friday group. And then um, some relationship with the kids. I mean, I developed. I think a pretty good friendship with Jeff um, and went out there to speak for his group a couple times. Um, in some ways Jeff's work was closer to my work, you know, the culture front, the values front, and then with Jimmy, similar. Some people describe Joanne as the ground of Jack's, you know, that, that she grounded him. I think that's right. How, what, what does that mean? Um, Diogenes, you know, the philosopher who was looking for an honest man. They said he was always looking this way. But there were a lot of potholes. He had a guy around with a lantern, who was making sure he didn't step in them. Joanne, you know, Jack, Jack, you can't do that because you're going to be in Philadelphia. Jack, you, Jack, do you want to say goodbye to the guests who are leaving? She looked out for him in all those ways and um, grounded him. Yeah, his anchor. Um, so what do you think that his, um, his example should teach the contemporary political operators? Well, of, of both Democrats and Republicans, but Republicans especially. Well, I think it's Republicans especially. I mean, I think he, his moment is now. And um, he had a moment, of course, with Kemp Roth and other things. But I think his moment is now, and the party very much needs to rediscover Jack Kemp and the spirit of Jack Kemp. There have been things written about Paul, that he's the natural heir to Jack. All right. per personality is very different, very different. But there are some, certainly some similarities. There's a sunniness, there's an optimism there. Um, but uh, never has the party needed what Jack is and stood for more than it does now. But I think that um, even though you know, it's hard to evaluate a person really through the present in terms of what they'll be in the future, I think that stature, he will maintain that stature. Perhaps it'll be, you know, he will, he will be needed less, perhaps, I hope, in the future because we have other people to step up. But I think he'll be regarded as one of the major conservative figures of the 20th century. Uh, one, one uh, since you fo followed all the way through, what, what was his opinion of George W. Bush as president? I don't know. I've heard that he was against the Iraq War. Yeah, second, second I Iraq think War. he probably was. I think he probably was, yeah. yeah. Why? He was not a war guy, you know, uh, for all the reasons we've talked about. And um, He was a hawk, you know, in the Cold War days. and Evil Empire. Believe that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's right, though. My memory is that's right. Okay, so uh, so how should he re be remembered in history? Final question. Uh, and if I've forgotten anything that you think that I ought to know, that people ought to know, tell me. Great, smart, capacious, um, optimistic, optimistic about the future, deeply in love with the country, and 
saw America as just one big promise and opportunity for everybody and uh, a naturally inclusive guy. Uh, you know, there's a great, I, I, I should put a note up on it. I have a, one of my favorite quotes is from Bentham. And we have at the house that I brought to the office, Lane wants it back at the house. Bentham says, um, the, way, the, way to, the way to make put people at ease is to make them comfortable. The best way to make them comfortable is to appear to like them. The best way to appear to like them is actually to like them. And I struggle with that because sometimes I don't. <laughs> you know, that's the bad side of my view of the world. Jack actually liked them. Actually liked them. When, when he broke into my office with somebody I wasn't expecting to see, I wasn't usually particularly pleased because I was doing something. Turned out to be a Super Bowl player. I overcame it, you know. It's okay. When I'd burst into his office with anybody, everybody, he was thrilled to see me. And that's a gift. That's a human gift. And uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you.